In this week's scripture passage, we read of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. And it's a scene we're all at least somewhat familiar with, as each Sunday when we recite the Nicene Creed at Mass, we profess that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. The Gospel of John, then, which we read from this week, uh, reveals a lot about that exchange that occurred between Pilate and Jesus during his Passion. And in that account, we read Pilate ask Jesus multiple times and in multiple different ways. He asks, are you the King of the Jews? And the passage is laden with irony in the true sense of the term, because here before Jesus, Pilate claimed to have power and authority. The crowds that are there, they profess to have no king but Caesar. And all the while, they're all standing in the presence of the true king and ruler of the entire universe. And Jesus' kingship would be put on full display before them, but they wouldn't even know it. Because his crown would not be a crown of gold or silver, maybe like Pilate's, but it'd be one of thorns. His royal robe would be one of mockery. His throne wouldn't be a, a golden seat, but it'd be a cross, the very means of his torture and death. And tragic though these may seem to human eyes, these are the very means that Jesus has chosen to reveal his kingship to the world. And so in order to better understand the nature of that kingdom that Jesus reveals and establishes, in this video we're going to examine both Old and New Testament passages to see how they help us to understand the nature and mission of Jesus, the King of Heaven. As the passage we're reading this week makes clear that although the people rejected him, Jesus was indeed revealing his kingship, and he did in fact establish a kingdom. But this isn't the first time in Scripture that a kingdom was established and the people rejected it. Let's turn back to the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. So at this point in the Old Testament, the people of Israel had grown into this great nation, right? They came out of the land of Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they were established and, and they settled in the promised land, but they had no one ruling over them. Instead, for a long period of time, they had what we call judges, which we read about in the book of Judges. And these were certain individuals that were called forward by God and tasked with leading the people not only to freedom from political oppression, but from sin and unfaithfulness. And although some, or, or maybe even most of these judges, accomplished that, their accomplishments never lasted long after their deaths. And so as a result, we're left with the tragic ending to the book of Judges, which ends with this line. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. This is a line that we can all relate to in our own day and age, right? But it's a, it's a tragic ending to the story of Judges. And so this lack of, of faithful leadership eventually leads to this fateful episode between the people of Israel and their last judge, the prophet Samuel, for whom the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel are named. And so in 1st Samuel chapter 8, we read the following. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Here we see that the people are asking for a king, but in doing so, they have rejected the Lord, who is supposed to be their true king. Now, we might ask, what's so wrong with having a king or becoming a kingdom? Right? That's exactly what Jesus came to do. 
Even Moses foretold back in Deuteronomy that there would be kings over God's people someday. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, Moses describes how a king ought to act and how he should exercise that authority. But if we pay close attention, it's not simply the fact that the people want a king that grieves the Lord's heart. Let's look at that line one more time. The people say to Samuel, now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. The Lord grieved at his people here, not because simply they wanted a king, but because they wanted to be like all the other nations around them. This is a point that is worthy of all of our, our pause and attention. When the Lord rescued this very people out of the land of Egypt, he called them to be a holy nation, a nation that was removed or, or set apart from the world. That's what the word holy means, set apart or distinct. God wanted or, or rather needed a people that was just that distinct from everyone else, distinct from other corrupt and sinful ways, so that through this people, he could disclose himself to a world that needed his healing presence. But in order for God to accomplish that, he needed a people that looked like him, not a people that looked like the rest of the world. And this sounds an awful lot like our scripture passage this week in the Gospel of John. When the people are faced with the kingship of Jesus versus the kingship of Caesar. Do I want to look like this Jesus, stripped, beaten, weak in the eyes of those around him? Or do I want to be in the company of kings like Pontius Pilate, right? Respected. Uh, adorned in, in nice regalia, surely uh, secure in his material wealth and his social status. This is the decision we have to face today. Although we may be inclined to want to be like Jesus, how often do we allow that to be our reality? Am I willing to look different on account of being Christian, on account of being a disciple of Jesus Christ and part of his kingdom? Am I willing to look different around my family, my friends, uh, my school, my work, on account of following Jesus? Because right, how often does this temptation creep into our lives? I know that it's there for me just to blend in. <laughs> How often does that temptation creep in that I just want to be like everyone else? Do I have to be so different if I choose to follow Jesus? Right? We find ourselves much like the people in 1 Samuel chapter 8 or in the crowds of John 18 and 19. Thanks be to God, our God is merciful. And even when we cannot live up to the call, He remains faithful. And so He uses even our misguided desires in order to bring about his saving designs. And so returning to that account in 1 Samuel, when the people are asking for a king, the Lord allows it because he's going to use that very plan to bring forward his divine plan. He is going to give them a king, a king that they truly need, who of course is Jesus. But before we arrive to Jesus, let's examine what the people in 1 Samuel got upon their request for a king. In summary, they got what they asked for. They got a king that looked like the other nations. They chose Saul of the tribe of Benjamin to be their first king, and he was not a man after God's own heart, but he was one like the other nations. But even through that, the Lord doesn't give up on his people. And so he calls the prophet and judge Samuel to go and find the king that the Lord has chosen, a king that will be the witness and example that they need in order to remain faithful to God's true kingship. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel is sent to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, where from one of his sons would be anointed Israel's new king. And this, 1 Samuel 16, is where we're given that captivating scene where all but one of Jesse's sons are presented before Samuel, right? These big, burly sons ready to be chosen as kings and warriors. 
and, and Jesse presents them, uh, one after the other, to be the next king of Israel. The only son that Jesse didn't bring forward was the one youngest scrappy shepherd boy who stayed back to tend to the sheep. Right, the older sons were all tall and strong. They were ready to be chosen. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so David was called from the fields and anointed there to be the king of Israel. Again, Here's one of those great moments where God reveals his true character. He's not interested in how the world perceives power and glory. Whereas the world just beckons us to gain, gain, and gain for ourselves as much as we can, to have the desired social image, the right job title, or the highest salary, the nicest home, whatever it may be. God looks past all of that, and he looks on our hearts. And he looks for those hearts that aren't filled and distracted by the things of this world, but those that have ridded themselves of everything else so that they can belong wholly to him. God's choosing of David, the young, scrappy shepherd boy, to be his chosen king has to be just simply one of the best displays of that characteristic of God. And so David was anointed as king, and he takes the throne after Saul was removed. And there's one more passage with King David that we have to look at, and it's in the second book of Samuel, because it's it's really the passage that sets into motion God's plan and how he's going to save us through Jesus, our King. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God speaks to David through one of his prophets, and he makes a covenant pact with him. And in that covenant that God makes with David, we learn that God indeed will establish David's kingdom, but it wouldn't be through David. Instead, it will be through his son, a king that would come forth from David. So in the passage, we learn first that God promised David a son who would be raised up after him. We learn that he will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, that this son of David shall be a son to God, and that of his kingdom, there will be no end, right? Every kingdom in human history has had its end, but God is saying this kingdom will be an eternal kingdom without end and without failure. So here is God's great and scandalous plan that through the son of David, God has ordained a plan through which his kingdom will be established and he will reign with his people forever. So after 2 Samuel 7, every page of scripture is this heart-stopping search for this son king who will come from the line of David and usher in this great promise. We're waiting for this son to come and fulfill what God has spoken. So naturally, all eyes immediately turn to Solomon, right? The the immediate son of David. And he's initially presented as as a pretty worthy candidate to be uh, the fulfillment of these promises that were made to David. But eventually we, we keep reading and we get further and further into the kingship of Solomon and he didn't quite live up to these expectations. And in the end, he, he rather proved to be quite an unfaithful king. So Solomon's demise proves that the promise must be fulfilled in one yet to come. Sadly, we we keep reading the narrative. We read the son of Solomon and Solomon's son's son. And king after king in this line failed, really, to live up to the standard of their father David. Few were okay. Even fewer were great, maybe. But really, most of the kings that followed David and Solomon only led Israel further and further away from God. But God doesn't break his promises, especially when it's a covenant promise. So even when Solomon and all of his successors fail, God holds fast to his promise that one day a son will come from that line and establish God's kingdom forever. And so God's people wait for literally hundreds of years for this king from the line of David to come and save them. Most of the time, I I give up on a prayer intention after about a week of waiting. So imagine waiting a year, 10 years, 
hundreds of years, and still waiting with ardent faith that God remains faithful to his promises. And it's in that very tension in which we turn to the pages of the New Testament and we begin to appreciate just a little more why the good news is called just that, good news. So we turn to Matthew chapter 1, the very first verse of the New Testament. And we read the most breathtaking line that a person could read who has been waiting for the return of this king. Matthew says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. The line of David has continued, right? It it lasted the test of time. From what seemed to be cut down, this branch comes forward. And Jesus arrives as the son of David. What seemed to be a forgotten and hopeless situation, God has revealed that he had a plan in place the whole time for fulfillment and blessing that would be fully expressed in the coming of his son, Jesus, who would be the son of David. The Gospel of Luke, he likewise preserves this surge of hope, right? First in Gabriel's message to Zechariah, This hope was re-energized for the one to come by the birth announcement of John, John the Baptist, who would prepare God's people for his coming. And then after going to Zechariah, Gabriel appears to Mary, and the miraculous birth of a child was announced. And we learn from Gabriel that this child will be of the line of David, and he will be a son of God. And he will establish David's throne, and it will be an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom with no end. It's like Gabriel was just checking off the promises of 2 Samuel 7. And so the breath that was held at that moment since we departed 2 Samuel chapter 7, it's now released in this gasp of joy as we read the beginning of the gospel message. The one who was promised has now come in our midst. This is why at every Christmas we sing with joy, we sing rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come to thee, O Israel. God has come in the person of Jesus Christ, and he is our long-awaited Savior and King. But as we know, when we read on about what this King does, and how he talks about his kingdom, it's quite different than any other kingdom we've known before. Instead of riches, this kingdom will be known by its poverty. Instead of judgment, it will be known by mercy. Instead of being known by the power of its elite, it's going to be known by the purity of its lowly. This kingdom that Jesus establishes is markedly different from the kingdoms of the world. So this is why Jesus himself can tell Pilate in our passage this week. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. This kingdom that Jesus invites us into is nothing other than Jesus inviting us to take part in his very life, in his own way of living. Because unlike the kings of the worldly kingdoms who command their citizens to work and act while never lifting a finger, Our king never asks anything of us that he doesn't perfectly embody himself first. So therefore, our king is a king of poverty. Our king is a king of mercy. He is a king of purity. This is why the guards and soldiers laugh and mock at Jesus' kingship, because it is so starkly different from anything they could have imagined. And from the vantage point of the world, it's laughable, it's detestable. But the paradox is, is that our true happiness can only be found in this kingdom. Only by way of stripping ourselves from the lures and attachments of this world do we find our most unshakable peace and joy, which comes directly from our king. This very point was so foundational for St. Augustine that he wrote one of his biggest works on this very theme. The work is entitled City of God, and he pens one of his most famous lines about the Christian life. He writes, Accordingly, two cities have been formed by two loves, the earthly by the love of self, 
even to the contempt of God. The heavenly, by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. And so we end by asking ourselves, which kingdom is my heart most drawn to? The city of God, as Augustine puts it, or the city of man? Who do I allow to reign as king in my heart? I remember an instrumental line um, from my early conversion where I heard, if Jesus cannot be king of all, then he cannot be king at all. Because that's what a king is, right? It's the one who has total authority. And so I need to evaluate if I have truly given everything over to Jesus as king. Is Jesus king of my life, my heart, my relationships, my finances, my sexuality, uh, my day-to-day -day decisions? Or do I only allow Jesus into certain parts of my life while I try to maintain control of the rest? But if I do that, I'm, I'm stripping Jesus of his ability to be king of my entire life. He's not a forceful king, but he will come at our invitation. So this week, let us remain hyper-focused on that image of Jesus before Pilate as king of heaven, beaten, scourged, mocked, bleeding from a crown of thorns. And let us make the prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come be king of my heart. Let my heart be your throne where you can freely rule. And by doing this, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.